Dr. Tibbetts going to come back up and uh, finish our tour of the uh, left-sided valves uh, with a talk on uh, mitral stenosis and uh, AI. Uh, so, like we've been talking about, uh, we've got a watering can uh, in the left ventricle. And this is an awesome picture. I've never heard the left side of the heart described as a watering can before, but when I look at this image, this is exactly what I see. I see inflow from the left atrium into the left ventricle coming out the uh, aorta through the LVOT. This is a perfect demonstration of what we've been talking about all day. Uh, so what we're going to talk about right now is when you have altered function of the mitral valve, and it's stenotic. So we talked earlier about uh, regurgitation, which is much, much more common. We'll talk a little bit right now about stenosis, where you have abnormal inflow into the LV. And let's see if we can get this other one to play as well. Nope, that's okay. All it's going to show is opening of the mitral valve from uh, an atrial view. And it's going to show uh, what we were talking about earlier about the uh, outpouching or the uh, dilation of the left ventricle posteriorly. And you can see our anterior leaflet. Hey, there you go. Thank you. Uh, anterior leaflet here, posterior leaflet here. Uh, so mitral stenosis, uh, which you see here on the right, is narrowing of the uh, mitral valve. Um, Abnormal inflow from the left atrium into the left ventricle can happen for a number of reasons. Most common reason worldwide is rheumatic heart disease. Uh, group A strep infection leads to rheumatic fever. Uh, when left untreated three or four decades later, we start developing rheumatic heart disease. We can have involvement of multiple valves, uh, but one of the most common valves to get uh, involved is the mitral valve. And so we can see uh, mitral stenosis. We can also see some component of mitral regurgitation. The other common cause for mitral stenosis that we see most common uh, in the States is calcific or elderly uh, mitral stenosis, which when you look at it worldwide, its proportion compared to rheumatic disease is really, really small. 90 some odd percent of mitral stenosis worldwide is related to rheumatic disease. But what we see here in the States is typically related to calcific, uh, calcific disease. And uh, there's important uh, differentiations to be made because of those, because the treatment uh, for those two types of uh, stenosis can be different. So mitral stenosis was the first valve uh, lesion successfully treated with surgery. Uh, this was uh, reported in, uh, from the Boston Medical Journal in 1923. It was the first disease diagnosed using echocardiography, and it was the first valve lesion successfully treated with percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty, still an important modality in treating mitral stenosis. And worldwide, uh, it's the second most common valvular lesion in developing countries. So uh, let's jump into rheumatic mitral stenosis, the most common, uh, described as having a fish mouth appearance of the mitral valve. I think you guys can probably appreciate that. Uh, you have fusion of the cusp and a typical hockey stick appearance of the mitral valve leaflet. So here we have an anterior mitral valve leaflet and a posterior mitral valve leaflet over here from an apical three chamber view uh, on TTE. Uh, and you see a uh, hockey stick appearance from fusion of the anterior lateral and posterior uh, medial uh, uh, commissures of the mitral valve. Again, we have some TT images here of uh, mitral stenosis. We'll see if we can appreciate any reduction in leaflet motion here uh, in each of these in a fish mouth view in a uh, short axis view of the left ventricle. Uh, compare that to the disease process uh, that we see in calcific or elderly mitral stenosis, uh, where you have calcifications deposited usually uh, more around the annulus. They can be on the leaflet themselves, but typically mitral annular calcification uh, is more commonly seen as patients get older here with a Western diet uh, and the anti-inflammatory effects that we see because of that uh, compared to the mitral commissural fusion that is seen in rheumatic mitral stenosis. So different disease process treated a different way. Uh, so the hemodynamics of mitral stenosis are that you have elevation and dilation of the, so you have elevations of left atrial pressure and dilation of the left atrium in response to stenosis and of outflow through the left atrium into the left ventricle. You can have reduction in the pressures in the left ventricle and on out into the aorta as well. These pressures uh, can be transmitted uh, re in a retrograde fashion into the pulmonary system and lead to a variety of symptoms, including fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, et cetera. How do we grade mitral stenosis? So you can do it with uh, a number of different methods. TEE is one of those, uh, TTE as well. We can determine a mitral valve area. Uh, we can determine a mean pressure gradient. We can also uh, determine the mean pulmonary artery uh, pressure. 
Uh, and if the mitral valve area is less than one centimeter squared, it's considered severe mitral stenosis and should be treated. Uh, mean pressure gradient's debatable, but somewhere around 10 to 12 range. Anything over that is considered severe stenosis. Anything less than that, moderate, uh, 6 to 10, 6 to 12, and then below that is considered mild. So how do we treat mitral stenosis? Well, there's a couple of different ways. The most common way that mitral stenosis is treated in the U.S. is actually with percutaneous uh, balloon mitral commissurotomy. Um, so the way they do that is on the left-hand picture here, you have a stenotic sort of fish mouth uh, mitral valve they put across a balloon which you can see dilated here in this nice 3D image which splits open the commissures and uh, here we are in diastole uh, with filling the left ventricle looking down from the atria you can see a nice wide open mitral orifice area uh, and you can see a decrease in the mean gradient from before and after treatment so we have severe mitral stenosis with a mean gradient of 10 pre-treatment or treatment and then afterwards we have a reduction in uh, mean gradient So how do we actually measure pressure gradients? Uh, as we were just talking about a second ago, you can shoot a continuous wave Doppler um, through various different places, and you can calculate uh, mean gradients or pressure gradients all throughout the heart. Uh, for the purposes of mitral stenosis, we would shoot a continuous wave Doppler through the inflow of the mitral valve leaflets. We can get that in a number of different places. Uh, four chamber is a fine place to, to try to do that. Uh, once you get your continuous wave Doppler uh, flow pattern, uh, you can just pause that image and trace that out and the computer is amazing, we will do all the work for you and you can get pressure gradients to spit right out on the computer. Uh, however, there are some pitfalls to measuring just mean pressure gradients. High flow states or high flow rates can lead to uh, an elevated transmitral pressure gradient, uh, even with only a moderate degree of valve narrowing. So if you have tachycardia, mitral regurge, or you have uh, uh, an increase in left ventricular volume, anemia is a high flow state. All those can lead to a falsely elevated uh, uh, transmitral mean pressure gradient. Low flow states can lead to low transmitral pressure gradient uh, despite having severe mitral stenosis, so a low, stro low stroke volume state or bradycardia. You can also have beat to beat variability like in atrial fibrillation where on one beat you may appear to have mild mitral stenosis, on the next you may appear to have severe mitral stenosis just depending on which beat you measure a mean gradient on. Um, and also if you have an increased angle between the uh, uh, mitral stenosis jet and the ultrasound beam, you can have uh, alterations in your pressure gradients. So here's an example of how we do that. Um, so you get your uh, continuous wave Doppler uh, profile, you trace that out, you get a mean gradient of 5. So no big deal, mild mitral, mitral stenosis. Uh, but while we're here, why don't we go ahead and check another way to determine if we have uh, severe mitral stenosis or just grade the mitral stenosis. Let's do a pressure half time. So we can take the same tracing, do a pressure half time, and we take 220 and divide that by the pressure half time, and now we get 1.2 centimeters squared, which would be moderate mitral stenosis. So what gives? We have one, one reading that says it's mild, another that says it's moderate. So the thing that we have to notice on this last picture, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'll, I'll give you the hint. It's uh, the heart rate is 49 beats per minute. So your mean gradient when uh, evaluating mitral stenosis uh, can be affected by a number of different things. Like we talked about high flow states, tachycardia can affect your mean gradient, falsely elevating it. So what we have here is say for example, a, a normal heart rate, 70, something like that, and we have pretty significant mitral stenosis. So moderate almost all the way to severe mitral stenosis, uh, reading nine, nine millimeters of mercury. But if we have an increased heart rate, say it's 110, 120, we'll almost certainly have an elevation in our uh, mean gradient. However, if we're bradycardic and our heart rate's 49, we may have a mean gradient that only comes out to be 4 according to uh, the mean gradient uh, calculation on the computer, all because of reduction in flow or an increase in flow, all due to heart rate. So when evaluating mitral stenosis using a mean gradient, it's we have a mean gradient of 12 at a heart rate of 110 or we have a mean gradient of 9 at a heart rate of 70. You've got to include those other components as well. 
Another way to determine severity of mitral stenosis is using planimetry. Uh, not the most accurate method to do it. I wouldn't recommend uh, doing it unless you're going to use 3D, uh, but that can be done as well. Uh, the way you do that, just take a short axis view, uh, look for the most uh, wide opening of the mitral valve and trace it out, and the computer will spit out a number. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, you have poor image quality usually. You can have deformed valve anatomy. You may not have the proper uh, place to measure the actual orifice opening, and so you may over or under, underestimate uh, the actual smallest orifice area. So uh, the other way we spoke about uh, measuring uh, or grading severity of mitral stenosis is using the pressure half time. So you can divide 220 by the measured pressure half time and determine the mitral valve area. And so here's an image of how you actually do that. You take your CW tracing through the inflow portion of the mitral valve, uh, trace that out. You need to have a straight line and you divide by 220. And if it's more than 220, it's severe uh, mitral stenosis, 150 to 120, moderate, less than 150, usually mild. There are limitations with that as well. Beat to beat variability with atrial fibrillation uh, can interfere with an accurate measurement. Um, aortic regurgitation, which is another high flow state. Um, changing LV and left atrial compliance and non-linear uh, non earlier diastolic velocity slope. So that's pictured here. So you have an early, early sharp phase. I totally stole this slide from Stephen Little. <laughs> By the way, thank you, Dr. Little. Um, uh, you have an early diastolic filling here. Uh, and if you were to trace this slope here, you would have uh, severe mitral stenosis. But you actually want to take uh, the longest slope that you can. So you need to have the same slope over 50% of the tracing. Uh, so you want to take the bunny hill, trace that, not the black diamond. Here's two other contraindicated things that you shouldn't be trying to trace out, where you have rapid change in the slope of a tracing, uh, either one way or the other. Neither of those is going to give you a very accurate reading when trying to grade mitral stenosis. So. Using pressure half time, here's another example. So we have a pressure half time of 79. We take 220 divided by 79. We get like 2.8 uh, centimeters squared. So nothing. Insignificant mitral stenosis. No big deal. But being the good doctors that we are, we're not going to stop there. We don't believe it because maybe the patient has symptomatology that's consistent with mitral stenosis. Uh, we can take... Um, Another measurement, we can use the continuity equation through the mitral valve and determine uh, the mitral orifice area uh, using a combination of measurements through the RVOT. So the cross-sectional area of the RVOT uh, times the time velocity integral through the RVOT divided by uh, the mitral inflow or uh, uh, time velocity integral. And that would give us 1.45, so moderate mitral stenosis. So again, a huge difference. Uh, all in the same patient, same tracings, uh, one tells you you've got no mitral stenosis, the other tells you you've got severe. So what gives? Um, there are limitations to each and every one of these ways that we measure. So continu continuity equation used to evaluate mitral stenosis, again, atrial fibrillation, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, all these things are going to alter uh, the reliability and the accuracy of these measurements. So what we do in real life is we take our best, best guess. So based on the symptomatology, um, based on our best two or three estimates, which of these correlate with what we think is going on, and that's the one that we use. So here's just another example of effective heart rate. Same thing we saw earlier with the mean gradient. So a normalish heart rate, 70 or so, can have an elevated mean gradient. You increase the heart rate, gives you an even higher uh, mean gradient. However, the opposite happens when you're looking at your time velocity integral. Um, that you causes a reduction, and that's the denominator in our continuity equation. And so that will uh, alter our mitral stenosis calculations just as it did for mean gradient. I'm trying to advance. There we go. Skipped a few. That's OK. I'm going to skip ahead a couple because I've only got like five minutes left, and I still have to talk about all of aortic insufficiency. <laughs> 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 no, it's okay. It's okay. This is good. Uh, so if we have symptoms with mitral stenosis, we do an echo. Uh, 
hopefully the echo is going to correlate with the symptoms. However, if it doesn't, if we have severe symptoms, we have an insignificant uh, gradient um, or a calculated low valve area, we do an exercise Doppler, see if we can elicit a proper gradient when we have normal flow conditions. Um, so should you have to do a TEE to evaluate initially uh, for mitral stenosis? No, usually not. Only if you're going to do a pre-balloon valvuloplasty or grade the uh, amount of mitral regurgitation. And you almost never have to do a catheterization anymore, which used to be the very common thing to do. Uh, so the most common way to treat mitral stenosis is with a balloon valvuloplasty. So there's an index used to calculate uh, uh, whether or not you're going to be successful when doing uh, valvuloplasty, and it's called the Wilkins Index or the Splitability Index. And so can the mitral split? So calcification, thickening, uh, mobility, and the subvalvular apparatus, uh, each of those is given a score. And if it's greater than 10, uh, they're considered unsuitable for percutaneous valvuloplasty. If it's less than 8, then you go ahead and give it a try. Uh, this is a really small slide, uh, but uh, the gist of what it's saying is most of the time you're going to be doing uh, uh, percutaneous uh, mitral balloon commissurotomy to treat severe mitral stenosis. Essentially, the only time you're going to have a surgical intervention is when you have a valve that has some reason uh, that it can't be split. So we were talking earlier about uh, rheumatic versus calcific mitral stenosis. Uh, calcific mitral stenosis, because you don't typically have fused commissures, aren't prone to being able to be split apart. If you balloon that valve open, all you're going to do is just like if you balloon open an aortic valve that's calcified, you're going to smush that calcium deposits into the, the annulus of the mitral valve. You're not actually going to fix anything. However, if you have a fused mitral uh, commissures from rheumatic disease, you can actually split those open and they should hopefully have near normal function afterwards. So let's switch gears. <laughs> All right, this is the whole story right here, one slide. Uh, acute versus chronic aortic insufficiency. So acute AR, you're going to roll down the hall and they're going to be sick as snot, and hopefully you're going to be fixing them soon. It can happen for a number of reasons. We'll get into why, the, why aortic insufficiency can happen. However, chronic aortic insufficiency happens in a lot of people, and those people are the ones out on the golf course still kicking around like nine years later. So acute aortic regurgitation, endocarditis, uh, type A dissection, traumatic, pretty rare, but can happen. Really, it's endocarditis and uh, dissection that we really see surgically. Patient tends to appear acutely ill. Um, they may or may not have a murmur. Uh, they typically have a normal or low systolic blood pressure. When we see them coming to the OR, it seems like the ones I see are always low. Um, and they tend to have a wide pulse pressure, uh, which is depicted here in normal. Uh, normal uh, aortic waveform here where you have a nice diastolic pressure that elevates during systole. In aortic regurgitation, you have this reduced way, way down. And you have abnormal uh, coronary uh, perfusion during this diastolic phase, which is extremely low, which is one of the reasons these patients can appear so critically ill and tend to circle the drain. Um, so management of acute aortic regurgitation. Patients are usually very symptomatic. Vasodilators may help in the short term, can augment for, uh, forward flow with inotropes if needed, uh, use of a balloon pump is typically contraindicated uh, in the hypotensive patient, and aortic valve replacement is typically required. Now chronic, why does chronic happen? It could be for a number of reasons. Chronic uh, aortic insufficiency can be uh, from bicuspid uh, aortic valve, uh, a number of uh, collagen disorders uh, can cause that. You can have dilation from an aortic aneurysm. Um, a whole number of reasons. So you have varying severity. You can have a long asymptomatic period for years, typically. Uh, they typically have a, an insidious onset of symptoms. Uh, they tend to have uh, an aortic insufficiency murmur, and you can hear that one. Uh, they tend to have an elevated systolic blood pressure, but they still have that wide pulse pressure. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but there's lots of physical exam findings used to describe uh, aortic insufficiency, which I've forgotten like 9 out of 10 of those. Um, so how do we grade that? We can grade that using uh, angiography. We can do color flow Doppler jet width. Uh, if the jet width of the LVOT is greater than 65%, that's typically considered severe aortic insufficiency. We can also measure the vena contracta, uh, typically done in like uh, an aortic valve, mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view. And if it's greater than 0.6 centimeters, that's considered severe. 
And here are some uh, echocardiographic images, basically just uh, differentiating between mild and severe aortic regurgitation. So here you have a small jet width uh, in the LVOT. Here in severe, much wider jet width, taking up almost the entirety of the LVOT. Hard to see on this picture, but just take my word for it. Uh, you can also measure uh, pressure half time. Um, and you can also look at the descending aorta. If you have reversal of uh, diastolic flow in the descending aorta, that's pathognomonic for uh, severe aortic insufficiency. So two live, well, not live images, but two uh, TE images, one of which is going to work. Uh, so this one. <laughs> was a mild aortic insufficiency. And just for comparison, this is severe aortic insufficiency where you have complete, almost complete filling. Uh, I did a bad job doing the echo, sorry. Uh, but trust me, this is gonna fill up the entire LVOT. Um, so how do we grade that? Again, we can calculate uh, regurgitant volumes uh, either in the cath lab or using echo. Greater than 60 mLs is typically considered severe. Uh, regurgitant fraction greater than 50% is considered severe. Um, how do we manage it? Mild almost never needs surgery. Moderate, uh, you may need surgery, it depends. Uh, but if they have severe aor aortic insufficiency, uh, surgery may, need, may be needed depending on the symptoms, LV size, so left ventricular and systolic diameter, and left ventricular and diastolic diameter, and function. If you have a reduction in LV function, uh, it might be wise to go ahead and uh, consider proceeding with uh, aortic, re aortic valve replacement. So this is a, uh, a picture uh, depicting uh, survival in years uh, depending on um, the EF. So patients with reduced, reduced EF have a shorter, uh, shorter survival compared to those with normal EF. Um, so again, chronic severe aortic regurgitation. If they have symptoms, it's a class one indication to go ahead and go to ABR. Um, sim symptoms tend to progress slowly. Um, 6% per year. If you have normal uh, LV function in an asymptomatic patient, only 6% of those people progress to symptoms throughout the year. Uh, progression uh, to asymptomatic LV dysfunction, 3.5% per year. Sudden death, these people don't die, 0.2%. Uh, they tend to live a long time when they're asymptomatic. However, when they have abnormal LV function, progression to cardiac symptoms happens uh, within 25% of people within a year. And if they're symptomatic, they have a, typically have a very poor prognosis, and mortality is 10% per year. So uh, surgery before LV dysfunction is the goal. Again, reduced, uh, this picture just shows reduced EF uh, and reduced survival. Normal EF, much higher survival. So you want to operate on these people before you have reduction in left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. Same thing here. And I'll refer you guys to the 2014 uh, ACC AHA guidelines to look at all this. But if you have uh, in diastolic dilation of the LV, uh, you should proceed to AVR if you have, even if you have an asymptomatic patient. Uh, symptomatic patient uh, should go ahead and go for AVR class one indication. So uh, you want to ha have uh, measurements that are accurate and reproducible to grade. Uh, LV dimensions and EF uh, in order to make proper decisions uh, whether or not to go to surgery. Echocardiography must be done using meticulous technique, uh, preferably the same people doing it every time. Uh, 2D LV, uh, LV dimensions are superior to in-mode measurements and consider cardiac MR if available. Thank you.